Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It is a pleasure to be able to share God's word with you. And on a special day such as this, we're going to have an exciting topic to discuss. We're going to talk about clothes. And all the women listening out there are going to go, Amen! And all the men listening out there are going to go, Ugh. But don't worry, men. I promise that you're going to like about what we're going to talk about today, even if we're going to talk about clothes. You see, clothing and fashion have been inescapable aspects of human culture since the very beginning. Fashion carries just as strong of a message today as it did back then. Listen to what this article from the British Council has to say about the topic. Fashion has always been an important part of how people define themselves and others. As such, it can be a powerful tool of influence. This can be direct. Studies show we're more likely to trust and even obey orders from people dressed in suits or uniforms. Fashion's influence can also be indirect and constitute a form of soft power. From Wellington's boots, to Gandhi's shawl, to Mao's Mao suit, from Elizabeth I's ruffs, to Diana's dresses, to Thatcher's handbags, famous individuals become associated with certain clothes, which they often consciously use to project an image of themselves or their country. To be clothed is to present an image, a status, or a statement to the world. Our clothing often denotes our socioeconomic status and role in society. To be unclothed is almost a universal sign of disgrace and shame. We've all heard about that horrid dream when somebody realizes that they're in their undergarments while giving a speech in front of a large crowd. This concept about clothes can also be seen in the Bible. The next time you're reading your Bible, see if you can spot how clothes play a role in the text. But here are a few memorable examples from the Bible. Jacob, one of the patriarchs of the Jewish nation, gave his son Joseph a beautiful coat that made it clear which of his sons was his favorite. The priests who served in God's temple were to dress in linen ephods, a special regalia that signified their priestly role. And the high priest was marked by wearing a special chest plate containing 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel. When Esther's cousin Mordecai heard that the king of Persia had been tricked into a plot to destroy the Jewish people, he tore his clothes and then mourned in sackcloth and ashes to show his distress and sadness. When the prodigal son returned home, he was quickly dressed in a new robe and sandals, and a ring was put on his finger to demonstrate his status change from lost to found. Clothes do indeed communicate a lot about us. Now, I thought it would be fun if we took a moment and looked at a few photos of people who clearly did not understand the rules of fashion or what it meant to be dressed for the occasion. Well, it's spring and prom season is upon us, so let's take a look at some of these prom pictures. Let's take a look at this picture where someone is meeting the Queen of England. And of course we've got this picture where it's a little bit reversed, too fancy a dress for the wrong kind of place. In this picture from the Shakespeare play Taming of the Shrew, 
we have the groom, Petruccio, showing up to his own wedding in this hideous costume to annoy his betrothed bride, Katerina. And in this last picture, I don't care where you're going. This is always wrong. Clearly, as we can see, it's important to be addressed for the occasion. When we're invited to a wedding, we dress up in our finest to show respect for the bride and groom. And us ladies, we never wear white to a wedding unless we're the bride. When we have a business meeting or an interview, we choose an outfit that will communicate seriousness and professionalism. When we go to the gym to play pickleball with our friends, we wear comfortable, sporty clothes so that we can move around and have a good time. Being dressed for the occasion helps us communicate the proper message about the event, and it helps us perform well in the event. Now, believe it or not, Jesus himself gave this very same advice to his disciples as he met with them on the Mount of Olives for the very last time before ascending into heaven. Since Easter, you may have noticed that we've been focusing on events that happened after Jesus rose from the grave. Not only were these events important for the disciples, they are of extreme importance for us today. I want us to look at something Jesus said to his disciples during that time. So turn with me to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start in at verse 45, and we'll begin from there. You can follow along in your Bibles or on screen. Then he, Jesus, opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temp temple, praising God. We've spent the last couple of weeks looking at what Jesus taught his disciples after his resurrection. Now, one of the clearest themes that pops up is that Jesus commands his followers to spread the good news and to make disciples. The passage we read in Luke says that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached to all the nations. Acts 1.8 tells us that Christ's disciples are to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 tells us that they were commanded to make more disciples, to baptize others, and to teach people to obey Christ. The command, the mission then, seems pretty clear. Get out there and start telling the good news. Start telling people about Jesus. Teach people how to follow Christ. The occasion is set. So why wait? Why not get right to it? However, if we look at verse 49 of our passage, Jesus specifically tells his disciples to wait. Why? Jesus has a gift from the Father that he promised to give. The disciples are supposed to wait for this gift. And this gift is being described as being clothed with power from on high. It was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the next big question we've got to ask ourselves is this. Why was Jesus making them wait for this gift? What is so special about the Holy Spirit that the disciples were asked to delay their mission to wait for it? Now, as we mentioned already, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit is described like being clothed with power from on high. We've discussed the importance of clothing and fashion and what our clothes communicate about us to the world. 
Jesus telling his disciples to wait for this clothing from on high was telling them to be dressed for the occasion, to be ready for what they were going to do. They would need the power of God to accomplish the things that Jesus commanded of them. Without the power and work of the Holy Spirit, the disciples would never be able to make more disciples for Christ. This message that Jesus had for the disciples is the same message that he has for you and for I today. We too are his disciples. We too are commanded to share the story and to make more disciples. We too must be dressed for the occasion. We too must be clothed with power from on high. If you and I are going to obey the command that Jesus gave us, we must have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, it is important for us to understand who Holy Spirit is and what he does. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is fully God and is worthy of worship and praise. He exists in perfect union with God, God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. He is not a force or an unconscious power. He is a living being with thoughts, emotions, and will. As John chapter 14 tells us, the Holy Spirit makes his home inside all of believers. It's his mission to help us live the life that God has commanded us to. Let's take a look at this list of the things that the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us and reminds us of things. He convicts the world of sin. He dwells in believers, never leaving them alone. He is a source of revelation, of wisdom, and of power. He guides us into truth. In fact, he is the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit gives and empowers the use of spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit is a seal or a promise, a down payment of what we're going to get in heaven. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He prays for us. He petitions God on our behalf. He makes us new, a new creation, a new creature. He gives us eternal life. The Holy Spirit produces fruit in us. And finally, he makes us holy and acceptable before God. These are the things that we're going to need if we want to reach the world for Christ. The world is looking for authenticity more than ever these days. To have that, we're going to need to talk the talk, that is, to share about him, and to walk the walk genuinely, that is, to live for him. Holy Spirit helps us do that. He works internally in us and externally within the world. So the big question we need to ask ourselves is this. Do I have Holy Spirit living in me? Am I clothed with power from on high? Am I dressed for the occasion? Do I have what I need to follow Jesus' command? Many of us have indeed put our trust in Christ's work at the cross. We have asked him to forgive our sins and to make us his child. As John 14, 23 tells us, anyone who loves and obeys Christ, God will make his home in that person. That means the Holy Spirit will live inside that person. And I know that the Holy Spirit has made his home in many of you. But I do suspect this. Many of us have let the Holy Spirit into our doorway, but we've not let him fully into the house, letting him into every dark closet and drawer of our lives. Many of us have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, but we've not allowed him to fully do his work in us and through us. Let's go back to that clothing analogy. Many of us have been handed the clothes of power from on high. But if we put them on and started exercising our new position and, and authority, have we been working on the mission that Jesus gave us while wearing these clothes? 
or have we kept them neatly folded and tucked off to the side? Let me take you back to that famous story of the prodigal son. There was a father with a large estate and two sons. His younger son rudely demanded his inheritance and went off to a distant land and squandered that money. The young man quickly learned that wealth only brings fair weather friends and that a life lived only for pleasure fades fast. Humbled, he returned home hungry and ragged. The father saw his son off in the distance and ran towards him. He clothed his son in a new robe, put new sandals on his feet, and placed a signet ring of authority on his son's finger. They celebrated the return of the lost son with a grand feast. But what happened the next day? What is the prodigal son part two? With his restored status as a son, he should be at work for the, the estate's well-being, tilling the soil, herding the animals, managing the servants, honoring and obeying his father. He shouldn't be lying around on the couch inside playing video games, or worse, going back to his old ways. He should be living up to the position he has been given as his father's son and be making use of the gifts he has received. I know many of you have returned back home like the prodigal son and have been dressed in new robes and sandals and a ring has been placed on your finger. But where have you gone in your new sandals? What have you done in your new robes? What authority have you exercised with your new signet ring? You have been saved and clothed with power on high for a purpose. You are commanded by Jesus to share the message and to make disciples. This is no simple task, for it will take an authentic life of talking the talk and walking the walk. But the Holy Spirit has empowered you to do both. The task that lays before us is a great one. The commands that Jesus charges with are not easy. We're going to need the Holy Spirit to make it happen. This is why Jesus told his disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit to come before they went out and started their mission. Being clothed with power from on high, being dressed for the occasion, having the power of the Holy Spirit will be crucial for success. Now, I know that if I were to compose a list of top 10 most frightening things for Christians, sharing our faith and our beliefs and trying to make disciples would probably be near the top of the list. It's likely something that we've all agonized over many, many times. I know I have. As one introverted, somewhat shy, awkward person who struggles with low confidence to another, I'd like to share with you four insights that I've kind of had to learn the hard way over the years to, about getting out there and making disciples and relying on the Holy Spirit's power to do so. Now, here's the first insight. You have to place yourself in a position where the Holy Spirit can work. Now, you've likely heard this old saying for young people. You can't find a spouse if you don't leave the house. The same is true for God's kingdom. You can't see the Holy Spirit work by staying safe inside your comfort zone. You're going to have to climb out on a limb to unknown territory. Yeah, that's scary. But that's where we're going to see God work. And trust me, seeing God work is going to make you feel alive and cause you to forget all about your fears. So the next time someone mentions having a bad day or something difficult going on, why don't you go out on a limb and ask to pray for that person right there, whether they're a Christian or not? Holy Spirit's going to give you the boldness and the words to say. Or instead of staying in your friend circles all the time, why not try going somewhere different to meet new people who need to hear about Jesus? Holy Spirit will give you the courage and the favor with others. Here's another insight. Choose courage over fear. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, or if you're a fan of the Princess Diaries, they said, 
Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. It's true that getting out there and sharing the gospel and trying to make disciples is fear-inducing. But let's stop for a moment and think about what we're really afraid of. We're probably afraid of being rejected, offending others, messing up, or receiving questions that we don't have easy answers for. And yes, honestly, those things can be scary, but we got to ask ourselves, what is more important? Our love and obedience to Jesus and our compassion for lost souls is more important than our fears. Though we are afraid, we must choose what is right. And here's the beautiful thing, beloved. Holy Spirit will help us through our fears and give us courage. Here's another thought to consider. There is no perfect moment. Now, I remember when I was young, I would spend so much time arguing with myself inside my head, wondering if I should speak up or share about Jesus in a certain situation. I would just be sitting there arguing with myself whether it was really an opportunity that God was making or if I was just imagining things. I would keep there, I'd keep waiting and waiting and mentally arguing with myself, waiting for the conditions to be perfect, you know, like for heaven to open up and this beam of light to shine down on the person that I was supposed to minister to. And the whole world would just pause and a unicorn would run through. And then I would know it was a sign that God was at work and that I was supposed to do something. Here's the fact. We live in an imperfect world, and there's never going to be a perfect moment or opportunity to share the gospel. The red carpet is not going to be rolled out toward it. There isn't going to be a neon sign that says, share our gospel here. We have to do as Colossians 4, 5 says. Be wise in the way that we act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. We can't sit back and wait for the opportunity to come to us. We've got to go out and look for opportunities to do what Jesus commanded. But guess what? Holy Spirit will give you wisdom. He'll help you see opportunities like you've never seen them before if you just ask him. Now, there are going to be times where we realize we've missed an opportunity. But instead of beating ourselves up about it, we just have to say next time and try again. The more we start looking for opportunities and praying for them, they're going to get a lot easier and easier to spot. Now, here's a final insight to keep in mind. God wants you to succeed in this. God loves you. And God loves people. And he wants them to know him. So, of course, he's going to help you and I out. Imagine this. Imagine telling your mother that you want her to be healthy and have a full life. But then when she asks you to drive her to the doctor's appointment, you say, nah, I got better things to do. Sometimes we think God works that way with us. You see, God has a grand plan for humanity and he wants everyone to be a part of it. So he's absolutely going to help you when you're trying to follow that plan and when you're trying to teach others to follow that plan. Remember that with the God of the universe on your side, nothing can stand against you. Now remember these four insights when you seek to obey Jesus in sharing the good news and making disciples. Remember that you, beloved, have been clothed with power from on high. You are dressed for the occasion. Put on that robe. Slip into those sandals. Place that ring of authority on your finger because your Father in heaven has given you the gifts you need to succeed, the promised Holy Spirit. Remember, just as God told the prophet Jeremiah many, many times, I am with you and will rescue you declares the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, you are a good God who has demonstrated your unfathomable love on the cross for us. 
You have made us your children and now live inside us. Lord, today we recognize that you have saved each one of us for a mission and purpose to spread your kingdom across this earth. Lord, thank you that you have clothed us with power so that we may be ready for the task. Holy Spirit, we ask today that you would make your desire known clearly to us. Lead us in the way of the Father. Help us to share the good news about Jesus Christ and to make disciples. Give us boldness and courage when we have none. Holy Spirit, teach us to realize the new authority and power that has been given to us from the Father. Thank you for your love, guidance, and care for us. In Jesus' name, amen.